estar aqui quem vai falar, que é a dona Beatriz Luz, possivelmente a Natália. Bom dia a todos, bem-vindos à, à nossa live, à nossa reunião do, Next, do Núcleo de Economia Circular pelo Exchange for Change Brasil. Todos me ouvem bem, aqueles que me ouvem dão, fazem um sinalzinho legal. É, começando na hora certa, eu já passo a, a palavra para a Beatriz. Bia, pode começar a sua apresentação. Eu vou ficar aqui no plano de fundo só controlando os participantes e as perguntas e tudo isso. Isso, bom dia a todos que estão conosco hoje no nosso novo ciclo de debates do NEC. É, eu acho que eu vou esperar mais uns dois minutinhos. É, as pessoas estão entrando. Meu telefone está 9h29, então temos mais um minutinho e meio. <risos> esperar um pouquinho. É muito bom poder estar aqui com, com todos vocês nesse nosso webinar aberto a todos. Estamos transmitindo via YouTube também o canal Economia Circular BR. E é a oportunidade da gente trazer, então, é, novas pessoas para o debate. A gente está vendo um interesse crescente da economia circular no mercado e o nosso grupo de estudo está funcionando desde 2016. Então, estamos no, no quarto ano, muitos aprendizados. Vou esperar, então, um minutinho e a gente começa. Bia. Oi. Catherine entrou. Tá, mas ela só vai... Então, ela só vai entrar daqui a meia horinha, tranquilo. É, pessoal, gostaria de dizer a todos que se vocês precisassem, precisam de falar qualquer coisa, vocês podem mandar por aqui, pela mensagem aqui no, no chat, e eu já respondo, tá bom? Olá, Cláudia. Olá, Joyce. Natália, Gabi. Já vamos começar já já. Bom, bom dia a todos. É, vamos começar, então, com o nosso bate-papo. É, a ideia é a gente começar agora apresentando para vocês o que, que foi essa jornada do NEC desde 2016. É, vou chamar um pouco dos nossos multiplicadores para falar. A cada ano a gente teve novos multiplicadores, então eu vou chamá-los para para dar um oizinho para a gente a cada apresentação do nosso aprendizado de cada ano. É, espero que vocês gostem e estejam com a gente nessa jornada de aprendizado de economia circular, agora mais do que relevante para o nosso momento, repensar um novo modelo de crescimento, de desenvolvimento. E às nove e meia a gente vai ter, então, é, às 10 horas, a gente vai ter, então, a, a entrada da Catherine Whitman, que vai falar um pouco do contexto geral, é, o porquê da economia circular, é, é, por que a gente já não está fazendo isso. E, no final, a gente vai ter uma parte de perguntas 
e depois a gente volta para o nosso bate-papo em português. Bom, então, o, o Núcleo de Economia Circular é uma iniciativa educativa, sem fins lucrativos, idealizada pelo Exchange for Change Brasil, em junho de 2016. É, o primeiro, isso, o NEC foi, acho que, um dos primeiros grupos de estudo sobre o tema no país, constituído de uma forma bem orgânica, um grupo voluntário de, de pessoas interessadas em debater o tema. É, eu, quando constituí a Exchange for Change Brasil, comecei a fazer muitos eventos e, e participar de rodas de conversa, e pessoas foram me procurando, interessadas ao tema, e a gente se reuniu, então, e resolveu constituir um grupo de estudo, visto que o tema ainda era muito novo para a realidade brasileira. Então, o Exchange for Change Brasil foi uma, é uma consultoria que eu lancei em 2015, com a missão de influenciar a transição para a economia circular no Brasil. É uma organização independente, conectada a uma rede de especialistas internacionais, com o intuito de trazer as soluções globais adaptadas para a realidade brasileira. Então, a gente percebeu, logo no começo, é, que no processo de transição para a economia circular, a educação é o primeiro passo a ser dado. Então, a gente começou com um grupo de estudo, com a nossa visão de ser um centro de referência na busca de conhecimento para a materialização da economia circular no Brasil. É, as pessoas foram chegando, a gente começou a pensar o que poderia ser a missão e os objetivos do NEC, e a gente colocou como nossa missão é, mobilizar a academia, a indústria, o governo e todos os segmentos da sociedade para a gente ir aprimorando o entendimento é, e, e a compreensão dos benefícios da economia circular para a nossa realidade. Então, o objetivo era criar um ambiente de troca, de cooperação, onde a gente pudesse fazer essa interação entre especialista internacional e pesquisador brasileiro, formar multiplicadores e, e capacitar cada vez mais as pessoas para essa visão holística e gerar conhecimento, produzindo material de referência para o mercado, uma vez que ainda não existia muito material no mercado em português. Então, esse é um grande resumo da, da trajetória do NEC. Né? A gente começou em 2016, estamos no, seu, no quarto ano, e é muito bacana ver é, a evolução desse, desse grupo, que se tornou quase que um programa de capacitação de profissional. Né? No primeiro ano, a gente teve essa troca de conhecimento internacional, no segundo ano, a gente expandiu para várias regiões. O primeiro ano ficou muito restrito ao Rio de Janeiro. E no terceiro ano, a gente começou a, a, a aplicar a teoria, né? testar a teoria em algumas regiões e, eventualmente, formar grupos de projeto. E agora, esse ano, a gente vai lançar o nosso tão esperado livro de aprendizado. Eu vou passar um pouco aqui, então, o que, que foi o nosso aprendizado a cada ano, né? Então, o primeiro ano foi muito essa troca de conhecimento. É, eu tive a oportunidade, numa parceria que a gente desenvolveu com a Holanda, de ir para o lançamento do programa The Netherlands Circular Hotspot. E, ao pegar essa revista, que foi simbólica no lançamento do programa, em abril de 2016, tinha esse artigo do Peter Gerson, que falava dos, dos oito passos para o progresso circular e o sucesso. Então, a gente pegou esses oito passos e a gente colocou isso como nosso plano de ação do NEC. Então, a gente começou a entender que não se tratava só de educação, de investimento ou de ter incentivos. A gente precisava entender a questão do ganho de escala, da necessidade de colaboração, engajamento de todos ao longo da cadeia, a demonstração de resultados sendo algo muito importante para as empresas entenderem os benefícios da economia circular e a base disso tudo sendo renovável. Então, a gente formou esse, esse grupo, for, formou, formalizou, criamos todo um procedimento entre nós né, de um termo de, cooper, de cooperação é, para ser um grupo que se comprometia a todo mês se reunir 
para estudar o tema e amadurecer o tema. E acabamos, então, no primeiro ano, é, fazendo é, oito webinars, dois workshops, e formamos esse grupo no Rio de Janeiro, no Parque Tecnológico da UFRJ, com 12 membros. É, a gente conseguiu, então, passar pelos oito passos com especialistas de sete países diferentes. Então, esse aqui foi a nossa lista de especialistas. A cada mês a gente se reunia e trocava com algum especialista nesse modelo de webinar. Então, lá em 2016, a gente já se utilizava dessa tecnologia para alcançar o conhecimento e promover esse debate internacional. Então, a gente começou muito com o apoio da Holanda, com especialistas holandeses falando de, de a necessidade de educação, ganho de escala, investimento. Depois tivemos debates interessantes sobre colaboração e engajamento e fomos buscar nossos parceiros na Eslovênia, na África do Sul e até na China. O Doug Woodring veio falar sobre plástico nos oceanos, que é um tema agora que está cada vez mais eminente. O Alex Lemieux falou sobre a, a importância de ter as pessoas no centro da, da discussão, é, não só fluxo de materiais, mas, mas, mas fluxo de valor agregado para as pessoas. E a Ladeia Godiva falou muito da parte de engajamento, da, da governança necessária para ter essa, esse ecossistema favorável para a transição. É, o Adam Woodhall falou muito sobre a questão da comunicação, de demonstrar resultados. É, falamos sobre incentivos. Tivemos a, a, a oportunidade de ter a, a GT Wind da Dinamarca no Rio de Janeiro, falando com a gente pessoalmente. E ainda falamos sobre a demonstração de resultados com o Brandon, da, do World Business Council for Sustainable Development, e só a parte de renováveis, que é a, a, o, a, a, o assunto que eu acho que é mais ainda importante para o Brasil, a gente deixou para fazer uma troca local. Então, esse foi o nosso primeiro grupo. É muito bacana poder olhar e eu queria fazer um, um agradecimento especial a, a todas essas pessoas que se reuniram, que se comprometeram. Eu acho que foi um, um aprendizado mútuo. E queria ver, eu acho que Natália e Danilo estão aqui presentes com a gente, se vocês quiserem dar um oizinho e falar para a gente o que, que vocês é, acharam do NEC. É muito bacana ver como que a gente continua junto aí nesse, nesse, após esses quatro anos. É, Natália, dá um oizinho para a gente. Bom dia, pessoal. E, como a Bia falou, né, que vem há quatro anos reunindo diferentes especialistas de diferentes áreas, para além né, desses membros que vocês estão vendo aí, dos, dos especialistas internacionais, há também toda uma rede nacional de troca de conhecimento, tanto para projetos quanto para academia. A gente tem o né, subconjunto do NEC, o NEC acadêmico, onde a gente reúne pesquisadores de diferentes instituições do país para debater aqueles temas técnicos que estão mais latentes né, no mundo circular. E, e posso falar que da minha experiência pessoal, pelo menos para mim, tem sido um grande aprendizado nos últimos quatro anos e tem servido para forjar aí o mais sólido que a gente tem de conhecimento sobre a economia circular no, no país. Então fica o meu convite de todos vocês para participarem do NEC, para se envolverem na discussão e, e para movimentarem essa transição para uma economia circular também. Muito obrigada pela presença de todo mundo. Obrigada, Natália. Danilo, Danilo, nosso Fala, é, é, membro que foi para Portugal, voltou e continua aqui ativo mais do que nunca com a sim, gente. Sim, sim. Um eu, olha, eu comecei a ter contato um pouco mais é, de perto com a economia circular lá em 2014 e fui conhecer a BIA, o Exchange for Change e o NEC logo no início, lá em 2016. E desde então eu comecei a, a trabalhar direto com 
pelo menos entrar em contato bastante com a Bia para poder aprender um pouco mais e ter contato cada vez com outras pessoas que tivessem essa mesma afinidade que eu tenho e fui descobrindo esse time muito bom e resolvi aprofundar o conhecimento, fui para Portugal, fiz um mestrado em economia e agora voltei para poder aplicar esse conhecimento, toda essa parte de academia aqui no Brasil e com o suporte do NEC e com o Exchange for Change. E foi muito gratificante, com certeza, participar, ter, ter a experiência que o NEC me proporcionou, com certeza ajudou muito a eu tomar essas decisões. Então, agora vamos partir para o doutorado ou talvez mais um mestrado e, e vão cada vez mais me, espe me especializando nesse tema até poder ver, de fato, a economia circular rolando aqui no Brasil, rodando sem problema nenhum. É isso. Um beijo, pessoal. No que precisar, eu estou aqui comandando o chat, tá? Só falar <risos> comigo. <risos> Não, muito bom. É, eu acho que o mais bacana desse primeiro ano foi o fato da gente ter conseguido reunir uma equipe multidisciplinar. Então, os debates eram sempre muito ricos. A gente sempre fazia um bate-papo é, com o um especialista e depois um bate-papo entre nós. É, e é por isso que a gente está resgatando agora esse, esse ciclo de debate que a gente vai fazer nessa mesma, nesse mesmo modelo, né? Então, o um especialista fala um pouquinho, aí a gente faz algumas rodadas de pergunta e depois passa para uma, uma outra parte. E é muito bom ver, eu fiz uma, uma análise, a gente está agora produzindo o texto do livro, né? E metade do grupo continua ativo aí, continua trabalhando com o tema, os outros acabaram indo para outras áreas, mas com certeza ficou um aprendizado e uma experiência é, é, muito importante aí para todos. Né? E eu não poderia deixar de mencionar o professor Newton Richa, que é o nosso professor embaixador lá do Gestore do Rio de Janeiro, da UFRJ, é, ele que foi um grande impulsionador aí do nosso grupo de estudo, é, eu conheci ele num lançamento do, do Senai CETICT de bioeconomia, num evento que teve lá, no lançamento do, do Instituto de Química Verde, e nos reencontramos, eu estudei na UFRJ, ele dava aula lá, e ele me chamou para fazer uma aula para os alunos dele, e foi lá onde tudo começou, a aula foi muito bacana, e após a aula, a gente começou a discutir pô, o que, que a gente pode fazer para continuar debatendo o tema e impulsionar o empreendedorismo nos alunos. E foi lá que, que nasceu a sementinha, porque que não a gente cria um, um grupo de estudo. Né? Fomos no Parque Tecnológico, o Leonardo Mello nos recebeu com, com todo o carinho, providenciando toda a infraestrutura para a gente fazer os nossos encontros. E, e por aí foi, né? Então, é muito bom olhar para trás e ver como que a gente constrói a nossa base de conhecimento, né? Desde lá de trás e como o conhecimento, é, é, ele, ele precisa da prática, precisa do debate, precisa dessa análise crítica para ser amadurecido cada vez mais. Então, aqui eu trago só algumas imagens para vocês sentirem um pouco como que foi, né? É, todo o webinar a gente tirava uma foto com, com um especialista na tela lá, então a cada reunião juntava mais convidados, não só os, os membros em si, e teve um workshop com o Adam Woodhall, da Inglaterra, que foi muito interessante, e até hoje eu me pergunto isso, né? o que, que vem primeiro? A, uma ação para você ter o, um... um uma, acreditar naquele resultado, ou primeiro você acredita e aí você, você age para gerar uma ação. Então, what comes first? Action or belief? Você precisa acreditar primeiro que a economia circular faz sentido para trabalhar e aí você tem ação ou você precisa ser meio São Tomé, ver os resultados para acreditar e aí você ter uma ação. Então, foi muito bacana esse... Esse, essa dinâmica e nos faz questionar sempre né, por onde que a gente começa. Então, basicamente, como um resumo, assim, uma, 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 
primeira análise crítica do que, que é a economia circular, a gente acabou colocando é, os novos três R's que a gente fala da economia circular. Né? Então, a gente precisa reavaliar o processo produtivo, rever valores, atitudes e as relações comerciais e redefinir produtos e consumo. Então, a gente acaba percebendo que a discussão da economia circular começa muito em torno de fluxo de materiais, design de produtos, mas quanto mais a gente conversa e discute com os especialistas de fora, a gente vê que é muito relacionado à, à cultura, às relações, às atitudes. Então, realmente, a gente precisa ter esse olhar da integração da cadeia e de todos os atores, para, então, a gente até redefinir os produtos e o consumo. Então, o grande aprendizado do primeiro ano, eu gostei muito quando um dos membros falou que a experiência foi quase de uma universidade aberta, com professores globais, gratuito, e foi de um aprendizado único, né? tendo a oportunidade de ter todos esses especialistas conversando com a gente. Então, a gente vê que a análise crítica é muito importante para o amadurecimento do aprendizado. É, nessa nova era digital, tudo muito interconectado, globalizado, a gente tem acesso a muita informação, mas traduzir essa informação em conhecimento precisa de uma análise crítica, precisa de um, de uma, de um tempo de maturação e colocar a teoria na prática para que isso realmente vire conhecimento. E é muito bacana agora eu, Beatriz Luiz, eu vejo na minha experiência, agora, no, no quinto ano de Exchange for Change, no quarto ano do NEC, como que eu estou resgatando todo aquele aprendizado do primeiro ano, né? e como que as coisas agora começam a fazer ainda mais sentido. No segundo ano, então, a gente começou a, a abrir para outras regiões, a gente criou o Facebook do NEC e começou a atrair muitos é, interesses de pessoas de outras regiões, então a gente expandiu para a criação dos multiplicadores. Né? Então, a gente fez lá, em, em, em 2018, um, um lançamento do, do NEC Brasil. É, fiz, formamos parcerias com a rede de pesquisadores, com o Muda Tudo. Aqui, Danilo, é, se lembra lá da nossa abertura, lá no Muda Tudo, com seu irmão, com o Gustavo, que também é um, um dos multiplicadores do Rio de Janeiro. Fizemos a parceria com a Braps, chamamos o Ricardo Liane para ser membro São Paulo, o Vitor Facina, NEC Porto Alegre, é, o pessoal de Campos e, eventualmente, no nosso aprendizado, a gente lançou o, o livro de economia circular com os especialistas holandeses e o professor Newton Richa foi convidado, então, para escrever um artigo é, nesse livro, que foi o primeiro livro de aprendizado, Economia Circular Holanda-Brasil, da Teoria Prática, publicado em português e que está disponível aí para todos vocês fazer o download gratuitamente, porque nesses dois primeiros anos de Exchange for Change, o primeiro ano do NEC, a gente tinha ciência que o, o que era mais importante para o Brasil era a educação, era criar uma base forte do que, que é economia circular para a gente poder, então, desenvolver isso juntos é, é, de forma robusta e a, a gerar valor para o mercado brasileiro. Então, a gente fez também algumas parcerias internacionais com o Circle Economy Club, é, o Lucas, que, que, que criou muito essa, essa conexão, e a gente fez dois eventos quando eles lançaram a oportunidade do Mapping Week. Fizemos um em São Paulo, fizemos um no Rio... É, e foi um grande aprendizado, junto com a Juliana, da Rede de Pesquisadores, que é, se tornou uma grande parceira, é, inspirada no, no modelo de webinar do NEC, essa troca, ela criou a Rede de Pesquisadores, que é uma iniciativa muito bacana, que facilita a relação entre os pesquisadores e o público em geral, então ela traz os pesquisadores para falar das suas pesquisas, num formato mais, mais coloquial, um formato mais que dê acesso a todo mundo à pesquisa. É, fizemos alguns eventos, novos webinars, 
com a Erika Purvin, da Inglaterra, que fez uma visita lá em Florianópolis, fizemos uma reunião local lá sobre design circular. E um, o que foi um, um marco também é, nesse nosso trabalho com os, com os multiplicadores, a gente foi convidado a fazer um evento para o BNDES, para levar a temática para o BNDES, e a gente aproveitou e levou... É, essa, essa temática dos oito passos para a transição. Então, a gente fez é, um workshop, onde a gente separou em vários grupos, e cada grupo debateu um desses pilares. É, e aí a gente convidou, então, os multiplicadores do primeiro ano para serem moderadores, é, cada um, respectivamente, para debater um, um, um tema e conduzir, engajar o público nessa discussão. Então, foi, foi muito bacana. Acho que a Natália estava lá, o Danilo, a Vitória, a Juliana, a Cris é, e, e muitos outros. Não sei se a gente tem mais algum multiplicador aí do, do segundo ano. Se tiver ouvindo a gente, me fala, dá um oizinho aí. Danilo, me fala, a gente convida ele para dar uma palavrinha também. Então, no segundo ano, o que foi o aprendizado? Né? Essa disposição para aprender é muito importante. Então, é, não adianta a gente forçar o conhecimento de ninguém. A pessoa tem que estar lá de forma proativa, querendo aprender, querendo trocar. E, e essa troca de visão local com, gera um, um aprendizado para todos. Então, foi muito bacana ver... É, aqueles multiplicadores regionais que estavam engajados com a gente, a gente fez algumas reuniões com todos os, os multiplicadores juntos e foi um, um, um grande aprendizado. No terceiro ano, a gente começa, então, a olhar os projetos regionais. Como a Natália mencionou, a gente cria o comitê acadêmico e o comitê de projetos. Então, a gente começa a ver o perfil dos multiplicadores aqueles que eram mais engajados com a academia, que tinham interesse de, de discutir o tema, de debater o tema, e aqueles mais interessados em, em como fazer isso na prática. Então, no NEC São Paulo, com a Daniela Fontana e com o Ricardo, a gente começou a desenvolver a ideia de um jogo de tabuleiro, de economia circular, então aguardem que ainda vai aparecer aí algumas pessoas que estão com a gente, eu não sei se a Janaína está aí, o Carlos Palumbo, a Camila, é, se envolveram aí na discussão com o NEC São Paulo, fizeram já alguns testes com o jogo, então tem, tem coisa aí bacana para a gente lançar aí esse ano. É, a Ana Rúbia também, não sei se ela está aí com a gente, do, do NEC Caatinga, a gente fez alguns eventos lá em Petrolina, visitamos algumas cooperativas locais de, de Mandacaru, é, fornecendo matéria-prima para a L'Occitane, fazer cosmético, incrível ver a quantidade de, de, de valor do ecossistema natural que a gente tem no Nordeste. Então, a Ana Rúbia virou aí já uma, uma grande parceira. É, a gente viu também algumas discussões em Belo Horizonte, com a Alice, com a Ivana... É, fomos em Florianópolis participar de um debate da Semana Lixo Zero. É, a Dani Fontana fez um, uma, um artigo que ela publicou no LinkedIn, comemorando aí, é, é, o terceiro ano do NEC, que foi muito bacana o depoimento dela. E temos várias outras, mas eu não consegui colocar aqui todo mundo, né? a, a, a Natália Geronasa, do Rio, junto com a Simone, de Chapecó, fizeram... fizeram é, dinâmicas, trazendo esse debate academia, indústria. É, então, muitas coisas aí aconteceram ao longo desses anos. Outro grande marco no terceiro ano foi um convite que a gente recebeu do Senai São Paulo para fazer o primeiro curso online de economia circular. E foi muito bacana, então, que a gente... Eu reuni vários multiplicadores, chamei cada um para para escrever uma parte do curso. Então, quem, quem ainda não fez o curso do Senai, é, pode fazer. A gente aprova o conteúdo, está muito bem elaborado, com participação de, de vários especialistas aí. A gente só vem 
validar ainda mais o nosso conhecimento. Não sei se Priscila está aí com a gente, é, Gustavo, a Juliana. E claro que a gente não poderia deixar de, de, de estar juntos no evento da CNI, que aconteceu em 2019, foi um grande marco, é, eu acredito, para a indústria brasileira, ter a Confederação Nacional da Indústria falando do tema, né? de forma a destacar a importância disso para o mapa estratégico da indústria. Então, no terceiro ano, a gente, o conhecimento que eu tiro foi como que a proatividade pode gerar oportunidade. Né? Essa construção coletiva e multidisciplinar é essencial para o desenvolvimento dos projetos de economia circular. É, da mesma forma que eu costumo dizer que uma empresa não faz economia circular sozinha, porque precisa integrar a cadeia, as soluções muitas vezes estão em conexões inusitadas, em, em, em trabalhando cadeias diferentes, é, as soluções também não vão vir de um especialista somente, de uma pessoa, é preciso muita análise crítica, muito debate e essa multidisciplinaridade que vai trazer essas soluções importantes. Né? Então, para fechar o quarto ano, é, a gente começa então, com esse novo ciclo de debate e o nosso livro que está para sair, aí, é, Discussão Global, Aprendizado Brasileiro, com o um prefácio da Isabela Teixeira, ex-ministra do Meio Ambiente. Conseguimos um capítulo de abertura com o professor Walter Stahel, um dos, dos precursores da economia circular, e que vai terminar ainda com cases, com iniciativas brasileiras. Então, a gente lançou também no ano passado o nosso documentário de economia circular, que por conta dessa pandemia a gente não pôde lançar nos cinemas, mas no nosso canal do YouTube vocês podem assistir ao, ao vídeo, ao trailer, e em breve todo mundo vai poder assistir, então, esse nosso documentário que traz para o Brasil cases da, da Holanda, a gente filmou na Holanda, e é uma forma lúdica de apresentar o tema para o mercado brasileiro. Alguns dos multiplicadores foram no pré-lançamento que a gente fez em dezembro. E, então, a gente acredita que o, o, o NEC construiu aí um, um, um grande aprendizado, uma grande base. É, eu estou muito grata a esse grupo e a essa oportunidade de poder trocar com todos vocês, porque foi dessa forma que foi amadurecendo o meu conhecimento, foi fortalecendo. Então, é, a gente via algo em comum entre os membros, né? essa conexão global, essa visão sistêmica, e um grupo de pessoas incomodadas com o status quo e que quer fazer a diferença. Né? Então, é, esse espírito colaborativo, esse trabalho em rede, é o que é mais importante para a economia circular, esse mindset disruptivo, disposição para aprender e debater, é muito importante, né? não tem nada pronto, não tem indicadores, as empresas, os, os grandes empresas especialistas estão debatendo isso agora, né? a troca de conhecimento é muito importante, o que a gente percebeu é que não estamos muito distantes da Europa, é, a diferença básica é que a Europa já, já tem ciência da importância da transição, e no Brasil a gente ainda está nessa fase de descoberta, de pesquisa, de, de questionar né, a importância da transição. E, independente do país, é, o aprendizado é mútuo. É, a gente tem que colaborar e, e a gente aprende muito uns com os outros. Né? Apesar da diferença geográfica, da diferença cultural, a gente percebe que tanto a indústria quanto as pessoas são iguais, os governos, em todos os países, né? E, então, a gente vê que ainda existe uma grande demanda, o mercado brasileiro continua demandando conhecimento e por isso que a gente está aí fortalecendo o nosso grupo, né? mostrando que a economia circular são novas formas de produzir, de consumir, se relacionar. E a gente fica aqui, então, com um convite aberto para todos, para seguir as nossas redes sociais. A gente tem um formulário que a gente é, elaborou mas para entender quem é o, qual é o perfil da, dos profissionais brasileiros que estão interessados em economia circular. E se inscreve, o Danilo pode colocar o, o link aí para todos. E vamos se engajar, porque acho que esse ano, é, ainda mais diante dessa nova realidade que a gente está vivendo, 
a gente vai precisar aí de um, de um novo modelo de crescimento. E Pessoal, eu vou parando por aqui, então. O, eu coloquei aqui já no nosso chat, aqui no, no chat do Zoom, o link para a inscrição no, no NEC e também a, a, o link para o curso do Senai e o nosso e-mail. Então, nós temos, já, já mandei para o pessoal que quiser, é só procurar aí no, no, no chat do grupo. E ainda assim, se tiver qualquer dúvida, pode mandar lá o e-mail que eu respondo, tá? Então, tranquilo. Pode continuar. É, eu acho que a gente pode abrir para uma perguntinha antes da gente chamar a Caterine. Caterine já está aí com a gente, Danilo? Já, já está aqui. Hello, Catherine. I can see you already. Hello, how are you doing? I'm just going to open to the floor to see if anyone wants to, to ask a quick question in Portuguese about my presentation, and then I will uh, invite you to, to join us. É, alguém tem alguma pergunta, algum comentário? Ou a gente pode deixar também para a gente fazer esse nosso bate-papo é, ao final? Não, Bia, eu já, eu já pedi para o pessoal colocar qualquer pergunta aqui, por, aqui pelo nosso link, uh, pelo, pelo chat do grupo, na verdade. Então, qualquer, qualquer pergunta que vier vai aparecer aqui primeiro no chat e aí eu vou passar para você ou para a Catherine. Tá, eu estou vendo que alguns multiplicadores já se... É, se... É, se cadastraram aqui, entraram. Estou vendo a Ana Rúbia. Ana Rúbia dá um oi para a gente. Maria Inês também está aqui. Tem a Ana Rúbia, é, tem o Carlos. Janaína, Carlos, quem quer dar um oizinho? Luiz e Valentim, olá, Valentim, tudo bem? Tá também. Cris. Cris, que bom. Oi, Bia. É o Carlos Eduardo falando. Bom dia. Bom dia. É, eu tenho, primeiro eu queria agradecer o Bom convite, eu me sinto honrado de ser um dos mais recém multiplicadores aqui do NEC São Paulo. É, só me apresentando rapidinho, eu sou pai, é, engenheiro, é, especialista em gerenciamento de projetos, 12 anos de indústria automobilística e tive o despertar de consciência quando eu te conheci no evento do CNI em 2019 e desde então Estou galgando o meu espaço ao sol e hoje trabalho como consultor e tenho clientes que são do setor têxtil. É, então, muito lisonjeado de participar. Eu tenho uma perguntinha é, bem breve. Eu fui recém convidado por uma instituição de ensino técnica para falar sobre economia circular. É, na verdade, é um webinar. E o público-alvo é de 15 e 16 anos. Então, Ai, muito do que eu... <risos> Então, muito do que você fala sobre educação ser a base né, para a gente é, evoluir na pirâmide do conhecimento até a gente chegar na prática de indústrias e governos, etc. É, e, e isso é um material muito lúdico. Né? Então, é, só que quando a gente fala mais de empresa, mais dessas conexões entre parcerias, você acha que é válido inserir na mente desses jovens, que a gente pode chamá-los aí de geração K, é, através desse seu material lúdico, até porque é uma escola técnica e eles provavelmente vão integrar as próximas universidades, né, serão os próximos estagiários, os engenheiros, enfim, é, é, daí para frente. Queria ouvir seu comentário sobre isso. Não, sem dúvida nenhuma. É, eu acho que a gente tem que começar a criar esse mindset é, nas pessoas desde pequeno, né? Inclusive, a gente tem aí no nosso grupo a Ana Rúbia, a Maria Inês, é, que é, a gente explora, a gente tem pensado a, a como criar esse material de forma mais lúdica, né? É, na Inglaterra e na Holanda tem uma iniciativa que eu acho muito bacana, a gente pode pensar em fazer um exchange for change, que chama Circle Kids. Então, ah, legal. Lá na Europa, eles já estão pensando em como é, é, trazer esse conhecimento desde a base, né? A gente precisa ter essa, essa, essa cultura inerente na nossa forma de pensar desde pequeno, né? Para crescer líderes com uma, com uma outra percepção. Eu vou fazer o seguinte, então. Eu vou deixar esse debate para a gente fazer no final e vou chamar a, a Catherine 
Uh, hello, Katrin. Thank you very much for waiting. Um, and we just got a very interesting question that maybe you can touch upon is the importance of circle economy education for kids and, and bringing people in an early age to, to learn uh, this new mindset, this new way of working uh, to be more collaborative and not, uh, 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 um, you know, uh, competitive. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to have here with us, Catherine Whitman. Um, she has been working with Circle Economy on her consultancy called Rethink Solutions. And she has written a number of books. One of her books has been translated to Portuguese and I'm sure she will talk about uh, that material, that very rich material that contributes to to our markets to, to be educated uh, on circular economy. And the idea is that we'll have a first part of our chat with Catherine talking about in generic terms, uh, what is circular economy, the importance and why we're not doing it yet. And then we open for some questions. And then uh, on the second part, we talk more about the cases, the opportunities, the barriers, and then we open for more questions. So thank you all, Catherine. Uh, now it's over to you. Please feel free to share your screen and, and have a nice debate for all of us. Thank you, Beatrice. Oh. Okay, can everybody, I, I guess everybody can hear me okay. Uh, Danilo will let me know if he can't hear me. And let me put the uh, slideshow on. So, yes, Catherine, everybody can hear you. You're okay, good great. To go. And you can see the screen okay. So, that's great. Yes. Okay, well, thanks everybody for joining us today. And I'd like to talk about why we're not making the circular economy happen and why business as usual is still the way we're doing things and what's wrong with that. And I think it's interesting that during the last few weeks, as we're all facing the coronavirus lockdown in, in various stages in various countries, that there's a growing movement for doing things differently when we emerge from the, uh, the lockdown. One of the movements is under the hashtag Build Back Better, and they're pushing for a more sustainable and fairer system of economics. And that's where the circular economy, I think, can, can fit well. So in terms of a structure for today, two halves, as Beatrice says, the first half is very slightly longer, but we're going to have questions afterwards. So we'll start by looking at what's wrong with business as usual. What are the risks that, that businesses are facing if they don't switch to circular and why we need to do some rethinking? And we'll look then at the different circular strategies and how those play out into example sectors and businesses. And then we'll pause for questions and I'll start with some of the questions that were that were provided in advance of the uh, of the webinar today. And then we should still have time for some more questions on that first half. Then we'll move into the second half, which is slightly shorter, and we'll look at the barriers, what's stopping us from getting on board the circular economy. And then I'll ask for a call call for revolution, a circular revolution hoping that we all go away energized to make our own businesses more circular starting tomorrow. And again, we'll have time for questions afterwards. So let's start by looking at those risks. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with, with this. We know the world has been changing very fast over the last decade or so, and now it's just speeded up with um, as having to face not only a climate emergency and a biodiversity emergency, but now we have a health emergency across the world. So we're facing growing consumer demand as everybody gets a little bit wealthier and has more money to spend. All of our resources are under pressure, not just metals and minerals, but land, things that we grow food and fibers for, for textiles, forestry and so on, and also water. Everything's under pressure, everything's finite. And we're on an ever more fragile planet that we're busy wrecking. 
On top of that, business as usual, the linear economy, take, make and wake. Waste is inefficient and very wasteful. This is a tweet from the United Nations a couple of weeks ago. Obviously, coronavirus is putting even more pressure on, on all of us. And these are dark days, but they, they think we have a short and rare opportunity to change the world now. Now is the best chance that we have because everybody recognizes we need to make changes. So it's about being part of the solution, not part of the problem. So this is my diagram of what typically happens in a linear economy system. So we start with some materials. And at the moment, every year we extract about 100 billion tonnes of materials to put into the economy. About a quarter of that is biomass, food, fibres and timber, and the rest is fossil fuels, metals and mineral ores. On top of that, four and a half thousand billion cubic metres of water go into making our products and services. The bad news is that nearly a quarter of that gets wasted, sent to landfill or burnt. And once it's burnt, it's gone. Part of that burning contributes to greenhouse gas emissions. So our manufacturing and retail systems contribute over half of all global greenhouse gas emissions every year. Along the supply chain, at every stage, we're emitting waste and pollution into the atmosphere, air, soil and water. And the extraction and processing of all those materials, the associated fuels and our food causes nearly all water stress and biodiversity destruction. And according to the Circularity Gap Report, our world is less than 9% circular. So we're wasting 90% of everything that we extract. And it gets worse. We're not even managing to provide a decent standard, standard of living for all our world population. With one in seven going to bed hungry every night and over a third of people not having access to sanitation and toilets. And shockingly, more people die of waste and pollution each year than die from malaria. So it's time to make a change. This is from a report produced every year by the World Economic Forum looking at global risks. And it's what global business leaders and government leaders vote on. So it's not, it's not some research scientists, it's whatever it, what's top of, top of mind, what's keeping business leaders awake at night. And you can see that an awful lot of the top 10 for both likelihood and impact are related to climate and biodiversity. And interestingly, this year was one of the few years that global pandemic hasn't been on that top 10 list. Most years it is. So we could think of it like this. 50 years ago, 100 years ago, we were like a small population on a big planet with enough resources for all of us. And it didn't really matter what we did. So that linear economy, take, make and waste, has been able to manage so far because we didn't it didn't really matter but now we're a bigger population it's as if our planet is shrinking and we've got a much bigger footprint we're destroying the very living systems that we depend on and depleting our resources it's as if we've built a system a bit like a leaking hose pipe we put water in at one end and at every stage along the system we, we lose value, we lose, we, we lose water until there's nothing left at the end. It's hopelessly inefficient. So it's time for some rethinking, time for us to look at doing things differently. And I'm sure many of you know this, but for those of you who are new, new to the circular economy, we'll just cover the basics before we get into examples. The easiest way to think about it is to compare it with the way we do things now. Take, make, use and dispose and pollute at every stage. So the circular economy is about doing things differently, 
keeping the resources and the products in the system for longer. And there are various ways we can do that. And we'll look at those in more detail in a minute. And one thing that's important to remember is that the tightest loop, these middle sections, retain the most value. Once we get to the stage of recycling, we're wasting a lot of the value that we've embedded in the product as we made it. And we're having to use a lot of energy to get those materials back. So everything we can do around here is much more efficient. So the basic rules are use less. So we mean fewer materials, so it's less complex, and less of each material, so it's resource efficient. And we're trying to get more from less, trying to use all those resources more efficiently. And we can do that in two ways, by keeping things in use for longer, or by using them more intensively, getting more productivity out of each resource. And we'll look at some examples. And once we've finished using it, we need, to, we need to get the product, the components and the materials back so we can use them again in a new product. Nothing should go to waste. And we mustn't forget to make sure that all the materials are safe, safe for humans and for living systems, and that they're sustainable. If I want to use to make a table out of wood, and I expect that table to last five years, I need the tree to regrow in five years. If the tree takes 25 years to regrow, I need to design the table to be more durable and to last that long. When I was doing the research for my Circular Economy Handbook back in 2016, I was finding lots of examples and I started a database. That's now got over 600 examples of businesses around the world in every market sector making circular products, using circular materials, adopting circular business models. And what I find interesting is that lots of those are small businesses and startups. There are far more coming from startups than there are from established global corporations. And I find that really exciting. It means you don't need a big research and development budget to create a circular economy model and the circular economy can create a viable business. So here are the three strategies that leading researchers want us to follow. So first of all, we want to slow the flow of materials by keeping things in the system for longer, making them repairable so they've got a resale value, maybe even remaking them and eventually recycling them. We want to intensify the loop, get more out of every product and every material as we use it. So we might put them into a, a system where we're renting them instead of buying them so more people can use the same equipment or product. And finally, we want to close the loop and regenerate the materials we need for a new product. So let's look at those in more detail. The first strategy is moving from fast to slow. Instead of fast fashion, we want slow fashion. We're looking to use and then reuse and repair. And we need to design things so they are repairable. A great example is Fairphone, which is, is designed using modules. So each of these modules can, can be removed from the phone with just a single screwdriver. And all the instructions for how to do that are on the Fairphone website. It's also upgradable. There's a better camera lens. So for £30, um, about $35, I can buy a, a new camera lens, swap it out in five minutes and send the old one back to Fairphone. And one of the organisations making it easier to repair things is iFixit. It's a global network of people who are really interested in helping others repair their kit. And it covers technology, cars, even clothing. There are lots of things on there. The next strategy is where we move from focusing on individuals, products for one person, to products for lots of people. So from me to we, we're looking to intensify the use of the materials whilst they're in the loops by sharing, by renting, 
by paper use and so on. And if we look at this chart, we can see the opportunity to, to make things, um, to make it easier to use things more efficiently. So in Europe, the average car is parked up for 23 hours in every day. And although it has five seats, typically it carries only one and a half people every trip. And less than 1% of the fuel that we put in the fuel tank is used to move the people in the car. It's really inefficient. So we're starting to see sharing systems and paper use like BMW Drive Now, city bikes that may be pedal powered or electric and so on. And there are lots of other business models designed to encourage people to use instead of to own products and services. And our third strategy is closing the loop regenerating materials so we've got them to use for the next product. So we're looking to get things back. We might resell it first and then remake it and finally recycling it, recycle it. And remembering that that's our least preferred strategy because it costs the most money and uses the most energy and has the most waste involved. So to give you an example of how the circular economy can help regenerate materials, let's think about oranges. If I was setting up a business to make fresh orange juice, in the linear economy, I'd have lots of waste. So I'd have the waste peel from the outside, the pulp, all that white stuff in the middle, and of course the pips. But in a circular economy, using biorefining and green chemistry, I can create create valuable byproducts instead of waste. So the pulp and the pips can go back into food manufacture as a thickener. Essential oils from orange peel are valuable for both cosmetics and pharmaceuticals. And in the last couple of years, a company called Orange Fiber has created a fabric similar to silk using waste citrus peel. So now instead of my single product, the orange juice, oops, sorry, I'm probably having to pay to dispose of all that waste. I've got a whole range of products making my business more resilient and creating new revenue streams. Thinking about remanufacturing, there are companies remanufacturing products made by other firms. So circular computing, who were a guest on my podcast a few weeks ago, are remanufacturing laptops from high-end brands like Dell, HP, and Lenovo. And they come with lots of added benefits compared to buying a new laptop. So as well as saving greenhouse gas emissions, there are massive savings in water, and of course, in, in needing less materials. And if you're not involved in recovering your own products and trying to resell them, repair them and remanufacture them, you're leaving a gap for somebody else to step in and do that. We could call it a circularity gap. So you need to think about where you're leaving value on the table for another company to come in and use. We can see some other inefficiencies here. This is a recent chart showing the end of life recycling rate for 60 metals. And we can see that half of them, all the ones in red, have a recycling rate of less than 1%. And over half are not recycled at all. So let's think about an example. What if I had a business mining gold ore? And this photograph here is the rock that gold comes out of, what we call gold ore. So if that's my one ton of gold ore, how many grams of gold do you think I can extract at typical rates these days? Is it five grams, 75 grams or 150 grams from that one ton of gold? You might be shocked to discover that it's five grams. Let's think about another mining scenario. This time I start with a ton of mobile phones. The same choices, 
how many grams of, of gold can I get from that one ton of phones? Five grams, 75, or about 150. So it's around 150. If I was going to invest in mining, I think I'd be investing in urban mining. And companies are starting to design products differently, so they're easier to recover and recycle. Adidas have produced this Futurecraft shoe that's made out of one single material. So when it's recycled, it becomes flakes and those can easily be made back into a new shoe. OK, so that's the end of the, of the first half, slightly longer. I'm going to move on to some of the questions that were asked in advance, and I'm just going to check the chat just to see if anybody's trying to ask me anything on here. OK, <laughs> I think I'm OK. It feels a bit odd presenting into a, a, a quiet space. Yes, it's 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 very uh, a unique experience, right, Catherine? Yes, very much so. <laughs> so. Uh, Are you OK for me to move on to the to the, the questions that were asked in advance? I'll start with those. Is that OK? Yeah, well, we'll first have uh, one question here uh, from Patrick. Patrick is one of our uh, newly joined uh, uh, multiplier that came with a result of the our activity in the northeast of Brazil, but he's now back in the UK. Okay. Uh, doing his, um, he's studying at, um, well, Patrick, what's the name of your university? You just missed me. Uh, but he's asking, Amsterdam announced that it will adapt Donald economic principles in the course of the recovery in order to build back better. Is this an opportunity for the circular economy to join forces? If so, what role can the circular economy play and how can they be combined with donor economic principles? Mm. That's a great question. And yes, I'd seen some of that. And he's from Middlesex University and of course, Surrey University, where I study as well. OK, great. <laughs> so thanks, Patrick, for that question. And yes, I'd included some of that um, information coming out of Amsterdam in my newsletter a couple of weeks ago. So the donuts economics model from Kate Rayworth fits really well with the circular economy. And Kate does talk about the circular economy from time to time. In the second edition of my book, I've featured the donut economics model. And I talk a little bit about that. And I also talk about um, the natural step and the future fit benchmark, which are ways of um, aligning your efforts with being sustainable and it all fits really well with the donut. So in terms of the donut, one of the concerns that Amsterdam have is how they move to a circular model, but be mindful that they don't want to, um, say, cut off imports from, from economies that depend on them and they don't want to continue with things like exporting waste overseas to be processed because it's often processed in unsafe and uh, unhealthy conditions. But rather than just deciding that they won't do that anymore, they want to think about how they can transition to a better model that protects jobs abroad, as well as providing a circular and cleaner economy. So they're using the donut model to try and um, provide a set of questions about each of the decisions that they're going to make in their transition to a circular economy. And what they're going to do is use the criteria in the donut with the, the outer ring of the planetary boundaries, and that fits again with the natural step. And then the inside of the donut is the social foundation. So it's about providing meaning for people, it's making sure people have access to fair wages, to education, to healthcare, and so on. So the model of the donut says we should all try and stay within those limits, within the planetary boundary limits, so that we're not depleting resources and destroying the earth that we depend on, but neither are we compromising the ability of people to have um, well-being and, and safe and healthy lives. 
So I'm happy to happy to hook up on LinkedIn and talk more about that if you'd like to, Patrick, because um, it's quite a quite a big quite a big subject. But I think it aligns really well. So Beatrice, shall I shall I look at some of those questions? I've done some slides to um, cover the questions that were asked in advance. Do you want me to look at those now, or do you want me do you want to ask me another question yeah. from the audience? Yeah, we are we are checking here. Um, as as we previously discussed, we invited our community of members to ask uh, questions in advance. Okay. The is checking uh, their names to check. And if you are here with us, the person that has sent us the question, please give us a wave. And okay. uh, Catherine, please. Uh, okay. So so here's the oh my my screen's frozen. <laughs> Here's the first question that um, I'm going to deal with then, and maybe whoever asked, asked this could um, give Beatrice a wave. So after going through this pandemic, how do we change the mindset of micro and small companies to a circular economy? So my response to that is that it's about explaining the benefits of the circular economy for the business. So as we've seen, using circular approaches means we can regenerate the resources we depend on instead of depleting the, the, the already finite resources that are under pressure. So by recycling and regenerating resources, that gives us more resource security. So we can be more certain of our future costs and, and help keep our prices down in the future. Knowing where our resources are going to come from reduces our risks and again, makes us more secure as a business. We saw from the orange juice example and from circular computing, mm -hmm. how you can create new revenue streams and new profit activities and new markets by using circular approaches. So that all helps the business financial health. And providing products that last for longer, that are repairable, that can be resold and remade, build stronger relationships with customers. You're keeping your customer for longer and you're finding out from them what they like and don't like about the product. So you can make a better product next time and you can deal with any issues and find out which parts of your product fail first and sort that out for next time. It also helps build reputation and that can reduce your marketing costs because now word of mouth marketing, so I tell my friend how good my Fairphone is, that cuts down the amount of money that Fairphone have to spend through Google and Facebook and so on. And all of that helps build a more resilient business. So we have a profitable, agile, resilient and sustainable business by using circular approaches. A second question was about agriculture. So the question was that agriculture and cattle rearing is very important sector in Brazil. And how do I think we can transition to a circular economy in that industry? So regenerative agriculture is a circular economy approach and permaculture also you might have heard of and that fits well with, with the circular economy. So it's all about using holistic systems. So we don't depend on one crop or depend just on cattle. We try and use mixed farms and smallholder farms are often more efficient in terms of their cost inputs and, and yield outputs. What's happened over the last 50 years mm -hmm. is that industrialized agriculture has persuaded us that we need to use fertilizers. We need to use genetically modified crops. We need to feed animals food that they're not used to eating and food that could be used for humans and it's not efficient so here's an example this charts from the ellen MacArthur foundation and it shows the increase in yields in farming since 1961 to 2009 so overall an increase of 85 percent but the cost of that has been massive so it we've needed to use four times as much fertilizer 38 times more pesticides and double the amount of irrigation for land. So the input costs to produce 
those increased yields have been massively more. So it's not as efficient as we think it is. And what we need to do is work with nature, work with all those natural systems for pest control and pollination. Those natural systems that provide us with healthy soils that are fertile and grow things, that provide us with clean air, clean water and so on. Um, the third question, I just need to move the, um, <laughs> the control bar. The third question was, could I talk about the idea of reducing consumption in a circular economy? Do I think we'll need to slow down consumption or change the way we consume? And yes, I do. But I think it's just a mindset change. We've been persuaded by clever people in marketing that having new stuff is automatically better. But often it isn't. And the thing is, there are hidden costs for all the companies that are um, building those planned obsolescence models, take, make and waste, and the need to have a new model every year. I think it's an interesting that Apple have stopped telling journalists how many new iPhones they sell when there's a new model released. And I think Apple are starting to move seriously towards a circular economy model. If we think about the Fairphone, if a better system comes out or a, a faster processor, a better sound system, I can just swap the module. I don't need to go through the hassle of getting rid of my old phone and swapping all the apps. And why wouldn't I want to keep something that I already trust and value and it's, you know, it's been useful to me for years? Why is a new one automatically better? It's not. So I think rather than thinking about having less, we should be thinking about having better quality things that we keep for longer and that are upgradable. Maybe we rent them. So when a new co one comes along, we just send back the old one. A renting system means the old one goes back to the manufacturer and then they have an incentive to get that back into circulation. My screen's frozen again. <laughs> Come on. OK, so um, in taking the Apple example, it's about slowing down how quickly we discard the products and slowing down the extraction of materials because there's a massive cost for mining and processing all those raw materials. And Apple have a number of robots called Daisy in their system. They're gradually increasing those. I think they're capable of recycling about 9 million iPhones a year, which is not very much when you consider that every year one and a half billion smartphones are put into the system, but it's a start. And they're beginning by recycling the conflict minerals, tin, tungsten, tantalum, and gold. And for Apple, that reduces the cost of their extraction. And of course, there are lots of environmental benefits. And for the planet, it reduces, reduces the accumulation of toxins from all the mining and end of use waste of those difficult materials. We could think about reducing and slowing fast fashion as well. So over the last 15 years, we now buy double the number of clothes every year across the world, but we keep them for half as long. It's really wasteful and it's pretty resource intensive as well. So again, we can come up with circular solutions. We can slow the flow with timeless designs that are still, they're not in fashion, they're things that we can um, treasure for longer. So not this year's color, but it's still a nice color. It's well made, it's well designed, so it fits nicely and it's higher quality, so it lasts longer and doesn't look um, shabby or tired and, it, and it's easy to care for. And those clothes should be easy to repair. Patagonia have the repair instructions for all their clothes on their website. So if something um, goes wrong, you can repair it yourself or you can send it back to Patagonia and they'll repair it for free. And those higher quality clothes have a resale value. So when we've got bored with it, we can sell it and get some money back. And we're starting to see lots of ways of intensifying the use of clothing. So renting, sharing and even subscriptions for clothing. 
and I've interviewed some of those fashion companies on my podcast. And at the end of all that, when we finally finish using it, we need to get it back into the system. We shouldn't be downcycling textiles into filling for sofas and car seats. We should be getting them made back into clothes. So we need to design them for disassembly, like the Adidas shoe, using fewer materials so it's easier to recycle them. Some companies are putting return labels in so that you can get a free post to send the garment back to the manufacturer. And making sure there's value in the end of use will help consumers to get them back into the system. Suddenly, if there's some, some money to get from the end of use clothes, it's worth making the extra effort to post it or take it to a specialist recycler. And the final question that came in in advance was asking about degrowth and the circular economy. And degrowth sounds a bit like having less and, that, and uh, consuming less. But again, if we just think about it differently, we can see how it makes sense. At the moment, what we're doing is growing by having more of everything and using more of everything. So to have the same facilities, to have the same services, to have the use of a car, the use of clothing, the use of housing and furniture, we're told we need to buy it. And when we've when we finish using it, we throw it away. So we're using massive amounts of materials just to get the utilization. In a circular economy, we keep the materials in the system. So it's about focusing on the, the benefits that we need from the products, from the equipment, from the housing and so on, and not focusing on the ownership and the assets. And as with donut economics and some of the other build back better approaches, we don't focus on gross domestic product as the number one um, indicator of health for a country. We focus on things like well-being. We focus on things like access to the products that we need. We focus on things like having mobility, not owning cars. So it's about using all those circular economy strategies instead of sticking with the linear economy where we exploit, we consume, and then we destroy all those living systems that we depend on. So Beatrice, have any more questions come in that you want me to cover now, or do you want to hold them till the um, the second section? Wow, Catherine, fantastic. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very inspiring and, and very interesting your comments. Thanks for the, the answers. Uh, very well uh, uh, structured questions as well. We actually um, have some other questions. Yeah. We just, uh, I just kind of make a comment on the, the last question about the degrowth and circular economy. This was um, a question that we have debated a lot in the last few weeks here because a, a journal from Chile has uh, published uh, an article um, suggesting that the Netherlands have. Um, have highlighted that degrowth was going to be their plan, post uh, recovery plan. And so we had a lot of uh, debates with our Dutch specialist partners, and they were explaining to us, well, in fact, as you pointed out, uh, we want to grow in a different way. Uh, we want to have a green recovery. Uh, the point made about degrowth is related to fossil fuels and uh, polluted uh, uh, solutions and technologies. Uh, so it's important to point out the difference. Mm. And, and what we are aiming with circular economy is, is to build a new economy, a new uh, growth model that it's more regenerative and, and, and restoring the ecosystem. Yeah. Um, uh, and that, before we move to more questions, we have loads of questions here, uh, Catherine. Okay. I just want to say from Lujamila to Chiari. Hello, Catherine. It's a pleasure to talk to you. I'm a big fan of yours. Even your book is in my master's thesis. Uh, so I thought that you would like to hear that. Uh, Lujamila, <laughs> I, will, I will ask your question at the end. 
Uh, I would just ask Danilo now to point out and thank uh, the people that have sent the questions in advance. And then we move to the second part and then we finish with some questions. Okay. Um, yeah, um, Catherine, we have uh -huh. another question from Erika Duarte here in our oh. chat group. Yes, um, she would like to know about uh, which business are more open to change it to a circular economy and the ones that are more resistant. Mm, okay, that's a good question. I guess it depends on a number of factors. I think sometimes it's the culture within the business and most people when they th think deeply want to do something that's better for the world but sometimes um, as we're seeing with the fossil fuel industry um, you know the investors and the expectations of earnings every year make it really difficult for a company to change direction so I think private companies and family businesses find it easier because they don't have to convince the shareholders. And perhaps some of the companies in sectors where it's easier to see that resources are under pressure. So maybe um, businesses that depend on things like lithium um, and some of the minerals that uh, might have geopolitical issues they might find it easier to transition to using recycled materials instead of new new materials each time. But really it comes back to um, that level playing field. It's not a level playing field between the linear economy and the circular economy. There are lots of policies that are, allow companies to, to waste, to pollute, um, and to do it without any cost consequences. So that's really difficult. But I think it's, it's, it's either one person really keen on the idea within the company then starts to convince the others that there are opportunities to be gained or sometimes it's customer pressure and we're starting to see more of that and i've got a good quote from the ceo of ikea um, in the second section so we'll look at that and i think it's interesting that companies like apple and ikea are starting to really look at different aspects of the circular economy models and to try things out and IKEA are very clear that to be relevant to consumers in the new world, knowing that we have finite resources, but everybody's going to have more money to spend and the population is still growing. If IKEA wants to stay relevant, they need to find a way of making things more affordable. And they don't see that making it cheaper and last, you know, last for less time is the way to do that. They want happy customers who keep coming back to them for life. Fantastic. So let's let's move on to the to the second part. We have a, a, a lots of questions uh, uh, here for you, Catherine. I guess we're going to have to stay a little longer after okay. the second part, but we will gather all the questions and we'll make sure that we, we address them afterwards. So please. Okay, so let's move on to look at some of the barriers and this may answer some of the questions that have been um, yeah. that are waiting in the background. So the first barrier, as I just mentioned, it's not a level playing field and hopefully you understand that, uh, that English expression. It's not the same um, for the linear economy versus the circular economy. What we see in the linear economy is that business extracts all the value, but society and our planet are picking up an awful lot of the costs of that waste and destruction. And just to touch on uh, gross domestic product again, it's always worth remembering that everything that costs money counts towards gross domestic product GDP. So if you have an accident in your car, the cost of the car repair, maybe even the cost of you going to hospital, all of that adds to GDP. But we wouldn't say it's a good thing. If we have an oil spillage, that adds to gross domestic product and makes it go up a bit. But we wouldn't say that's a good thing. So it's why it's, it's seen um, by many people as a very crude measure and not the one that we should be focusing on. So going back to this chart here, we can see at every stage in the supply chain, there are waste and uh, there's waste and pollution going into the system. 
And if you go to look at the uh, report from Circle Economy, the Circularity Gap Report, there are some really good charts in there that explain how these resources are being lost and what effect it's having and which sectors um, are contributing where. So barrier number two is the focus on the short term. We need to focus on this year's targets and that might be a particular problem for public um, companies, PLCs, that are driven by their shareholders. But I think we're starting to reach a tipping point. We've seen a lot of the circular economy innovators, the companies creating new products from waste, creating new materials from things like algae and seaweed and waste fish, and, and creating value, just as I showed with the orange juice example. And we're starting to move into this group of early adopters. And then there's, a, there's always a bit of a gap before the, the, the majority get on board. But I think we're close to that tipping point now when somewhere between 10 and 20% of people start to think that the new ways are better. And you've probably heard of Clayton Christensen, the author of The Innovator's Dilemma. This is a quote from him that says, when you break an old business model, it's always going to require some of the leaders to just follow their gut instinct. There'll always be good reasons not to take that risk. But if you only do what, what's worked in the past, one day you wake up and, and find that your competitors have passed you by. And if you look in, your, in any of your sectors, you'll start to see companies doing things differently, doing things in a more circular way. And if you don't start making changes now, you'll be left behind. Barrier number three is, is the perception that all of this costs too much money and that companies are focusing on, the, on this year and therefore can't afford to invest in new approaches. There are lots of reports starting to come out from the global consultancies and from the World Economic Forum showing that businesses that work on uh, circular bases are doing better than the rest of the economy. Circular economy can create new jobs and can release a lot of money that's that's at the moment dealing with waste and pollution or that we're throwing away at the end of its life. And CEOs like this gentleman from Tata Chemicals are saying are saying there's no choice. It's unsustainable to be unsustainable. And here's a quote from Jesper Brodin of IKEA. This was from a really good podcast, the Global Optimism podcast, with uh, Christiana Figueres, who'd put together the, um, the UN Paris Agreement and some of her colleagues. So they interviewed Jesper Brodin about IKEA's circular economy strategy. And he was really clear at the beginning that it's the right thing to do in order to serve the growing population within what they can afford within their wallets. And he said, if you don't have circularity built into your model, you're going to be more expensive because depending on virgin raw materials like we did in the 1900s is no longer sustainable. And his advice was to commit and set your targets and then find the solution. Don't wait until you've got the solution, set, set your strategy now, and then customers know where you're headed. And as you often um, find when you're doing something yourself, once you set your mind in one direction, somehow fate seems to step in and lend you a hand. The opportunities start to appear. And the last barrier is people say consumers, customers don't want this. But this is from a survey on the circular economy by ING Bank in the Netherlands, and they support a lot of circular economy businesses and strategies. And the numbers are pretty clear. Three quarters of people are saying going green is more important than economic growth and GDP. Nearly two thirds think people in their country are consuming too much. Six in 10 people expect to repair products in the next few years instead of chucking them away. And we're seeing some of this on social media now that companies that aren't doing the right thing are getting a backlash 
and that reputation damage can be lasting. And we saw, we saw similar things with the way that companies were responding to the, the uh, coronavirus pandemic. Those companies that canceled orders and put people out of work faced a backlash. So it's all about focusing on the circular strategy. And you could do this as an original equipment manufacturer or a brand. You can do this as a circular service provider, like circular computing that we saw doing right remanufacturing for other people's laptops. And you can help set up people to people sharing services or even do your repairs and sharing yourself. So the circular economy creates new revenue streams, provides you with new customers, maybe in markets that you've not been to before because now your products are more affordable. Maybe a remanufactured product is much cheaper, but has the same warranty. And all of this can give you a customer for life. And that's much more valuable than having to spend money on Google and Facebook chasing down new customers and not knowing whether anybody liked what you did last time or not. So it's time for a rev revolution, a circular revolution. We've seen the three strategies and you can start any of these now. It doesn't have to be a completely new strategy. You can start by just making things that are better quality and maybe pr providing spare parts and repair services and, and creating a revenue stream from that. You might look at setting up a sharing service. So BMW's Drive Now service operates with standard BMW cars. And they set that up as a, a kind of um, pay-as-you-go car rental. They set that up for BMW owners who really love the brand and want to be able to drive a car that fits their image and that they're, they're comfortable driving when they're away from, from home. <laughs> Maybe that's not going to be so popular now. But if you're flying abroad and you need a car at the airport, um, why not have the BMW car that you like? But what BMW found was lots of non-BMW owners wanted to use the Drive Now rental service as well. So suddenly BMW had access to a whole new set of potential BMW customers. And the other thing we need to do is close the loop and regenerate to keep everything in the system instead of wasting it and contributing to waste and pollution and emissions. So back to that Clayton Christensen quote. If you only do what worked in the past, one day you're going to be overtaken by the by the competition. It's about th thinking through the rewards. What can the circular economy do to, Im to improve your business? How do you make the business case? Where are the hard numbers, the cost savings, the new revenue streams, the reduced spend on marketing? And where are the soft benefits in terms of reduced risk, resource security, better relationships with customers and so on and use all of those different factors to build a strong business case and convince those people in your business who might be skeptical and just want to carry on with business as usual. We all want the easy route, don't we? And business as usual seems easy, but it's not future fit. So it's about moving from consuming to using and thinking about how those goods we're using today become tomorrow's resources, but at a cheaper price because we paid for them yesterday. And this is for the European Union, but you can see massive benefits in terms of savings and also massive improvements in carbon emissions, fewer greenhouse gases and a number of new jobs in those repair, remanufacturing, rental and reuse services. So it's about changing the mindset. Instead of thinking, how can we do a bit less bad? How can we be a bit more resource efficient? How can we cut down our pollution a little bit? It's thinking about how we can go circular and do more good. And if you look around, you'll see that the future's already here. Lots of businesses are going circular. If you look on Circle Economy's Circle Lab database, there are thousands of examples on there and it's really easy to search. And I've been loading my um, database into that over the last few months. So 
go on there, have a look for your market sector or have a look at your at the kind of materials that you use and see what's happening. And hopefully you'll see some ideas to inspire you rather than finding out that your competitors going to get there before you. And if you want to know more, um, why not have a listen to the podcast or shameless plug here by the book. Um, and there's a second edition coming out in, in October. If you want to buy it from Kogan Page, I don't know whether my screen sharing thing is in the way, um, then you can use that discount, Circular 20. So that's the publisher Kogan Page. And so, um, any more questions? Well, Catherine, thank you very much. Um, I really like the way that you transform the view of barriers to a view of opportunities. <laughs> and I think, I guess this is uh, our role as, as I say, circular economy change makers, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, it's very important. And from my experience working directly with circular economy for the last five years, it takes time for business to grasp, you know, what exactly means. I, I usually say that uh, companies need uh, three uh, meetings with me before they understand what circular economy is about. Uh, so I really like the way you presented, you know, the benefits, the opportunities, uh, and, and, and the way that we need to, to innovate, to survive, to be future proof so it's about risks and being proof uh, to the future that is ahead of us and i really like also when you mentioned the the consumer so in in inside they really want uh, new products companies that have a responsibility towards the the, the environment so we need also to teach them uh, what exactly means, what is a sustainable product, what is uh, a circular economy, so they can really uh, address and make the right product selections. Mm. Um, so I guess, um, are you okay with time? Can you stay yeah. with us a little yeah. bit more? Yeah. Uh, great. Uh, we will select um, uh, a couple of questions here. Uh, Natalia, do you want to to tell us uh, how is the conversation going at YouTube? Oh, hello. We are dealing with a lot of a great audience in YouTube. So the we have a question we already have mentioned and about from just a second, please. Blue Jamila. So not make any mistake. We have a very busy chat here with all guys. Uh, just a minute, please. Uh, Natalia, I have a question here in Zoom from Natalia Feltrin. She, uh, so I will ask this one first and then you have time to get this one. Okay? Yeah, good. Go on. Uh, Catherine, she, uh, Natalia, Feltrin is asking about um, the how can we transform, how can we um, go into circular economy in underdeveloped con economies? How can you, how do you think this can work? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. And um, I'm just going to make a note because there was, there's a report um, that was done by a UK uh, think tank called Chatham House that my colleague Peter works with from time to time. So they did a report only um, a month or so ago that I included in one of my newsletters about the need to make sure that the circular economy doesn't impose um, even worse systems on, on developing countries and how we need to make sure it's a fair and just transition. But there are lots of opportunities so often in, say, Africa, local um, cities and local governments can't afford to spend money on waste processing and recycling. So the waste just goes into informal landfill 
and then is polluting the, the farmland and the surrounding area. And even worse, some countries are importing waste to process and particularly electronic waste, which is then dealt with informally, and sometimes illegally. Um, sometimes that means it's burnt so that what's left at the end ju are just the precious metals and all the plastic is burnt away. But that's not done in a safe incinerator. It's done out in the open with people breathing all those toxic fumes. But one of the things we can do is, is work on um, smaller scale systems. So one of my podcast guests had found a way to do um, uh, a tiny uh, plastic shredding machine that could be connected to a 3D printer that was at kind of, uh, you know, school scale or business scale and let people experiment with transforming plastic waste into products that they could design themselves to kind of create um, create some um, some ideas and some creativity and give people ideas for what they could do with plastic waste. And there's a company at the moment trying to develop a household appliance for recycling that again takes things like bottles and cans and paper and shreds them so that they're more valuable for a recycler um, because they're more compact and so on. So there are lots of very small scale things that we could um, either um, you know, help developing com uh, economies to get hold of or that they could even design themselves. And there's something called um, frugal innovation or Dugard innovation. Um, there's a good book on that. And that's all about a different approach to innovation that has cost and scale as a major constraint. So it doesn't assume that you're going to have millions of pounds, millions of dollars in a, a development budget. Um, it assumes you have hardly any money and looks at how you can create a different way of doing things and still have a viable product. So I think there are lots of opportunities to make better lives, to create more meaningful jobs with a, a green economy in developing countries. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. And I guess I can also contribute from my experience here, uh, influencing the transition in Brazil. And not only uh, the point of creating more meaningful jobs, I think it's worth highlighting the fact that uh, we're not just looking at more durable and high quality and more expensive uh, products. Uh, if we do move towards more durable products, it means also that we have an opportunity for a repair sector, a remanufacturing sector. So by doing the remanufacturing, we can fix that durable product and, and put out in the market again uh, uh, with a lower cost. Mm -hmm. So a lower cost for the company and a lower cost for the community. And, and also, I think we have to bear in mind that part of the circle economy is sharing economy. So for this uh, perspective, for example, uh, Uber or, or sharing, uh, bicycle sharing. So we don't need to own a car anymore. We don't need to own a bicycle. So we can just use uh, the moment that we need that product. Uh, so there are several ways of looking at the opportunities for developing economy. Uh, and another element is that um, when we are uh, creating this idea of more durable products for companies, uh, also brings the opportunity of providing a service to the market instead of the product. Mm -hmm. So we have a good example in the in the Netherlands of bundles. Uh, so I don't know if you know, uh, Katrin, um, I always like to highlight together with Fairphone, for me, is another great example. Uh, you don't need to own a wash machine, so you can pay for a service to have the use of this washing machine uh, in, in your house, and you pay a monthly fee. So you have access to a high quality product, the most efficient product in the market, but you pay per use. So you, you, you have access to a service. It's like a, 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 
television uh, um, uh, program like we have net vivo so you pay in the beginning of the contract you receive the equipment and then you pay a monthly fee depending on how much you use so it's important in my view when you think about circular economy to have this holistic view the systemic of view of the of the several business models uh, sometimes people just get fixed in one particular aspect or more durable products will be more expensive. Mm. Uh, what happened with all the, 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 the people that don't afford uh, uh, to have access to the product? They will have access to the products in a different way. So yeah. circular economy is about different forms of consumption and different forms of um, production. Um, so I guess um, uh, this, this for me, it's a very- I'm ready positive. right now. Yeah, it's a very positive aspect of circular economy for the developing world. So, yes, Natalia, you're, you're, you're right, Beatriz, and I think remanufacturing is really important. And it's worth remembering that in America, the law is that a remanufactured product has to have the same warranty as a new one. So it yeah. means it's just as good quality. And for companies like Caterpillar and Cummins, remanufacturing is the most profitable part of their business. So it's not about an inferior product at exactly. all and and just to pick on the um um the washing machine example in one of my uh, podcasts i interviewed uh, professor nancy bocken um from um tu delft university so she does a lot of work on circular economy business models and she and some colleagues a number of years ago developed a paper use home appliances starting with a washing machine it's called homey h-o-m-i-e i can send the link through but you pay for every time you use the washing machine. So if you use hotter water or a longer wash, you pay more. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, what they found was very quickly, customers were using a third less energy and water than they had been before because they were focused on um, you know, using less of everything. It's a really good system. Yeah, yeah it's a way to educate the consumer as well, yeah? So we, we, it's it's a new way of of dealing with products and services, and the role of the industry is to educate us. You know, we, we don't we don't know. Yeah, they are much smarter than us in a way. Um, so um, wow, with so many questions, I'm kind of at lost. Yeah, here, I would right? like to point to questions from our YouTube audience. There's a lot of people watching us on YouTube as well. Mm -hmm. So L Ludmila Turkiari, that Beatrice mentioned before, a big fan of yours, would like to know how can we better identify process and, and how to look for flows to transform into a more circular economy model. And if we could start by analyzing, analyzing how its reverse logistics would work. So I imagine something around the the role of reverse logistics in, in processes and how, how to identify the best leverage points to the circular transitions. Can you please talk about us today? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think lots of companies don't have an effective reverse logistics system that's fit for use in the circular economy. If I think about how, say, um, electronics reverse logistics works in the UK, so as part of the European Union law, um, waste electronics are collected either by the company that sells you a new washing machine. They may take take back the old washing machine, but mostly um, you take your waste electronics to the, uh, the local council site. But you may take something in that um, I don't know, maybe maybe it's even still working. Maybe you've just decided you want a new a new TV for the World Cup and, you know, with a better better definition screen. So you take your old TV that's still working, but it goes into a, a you know, a big container the size of a room, a, a skip, we call them. So by the time you've chucked it in there, it's gone from being working and having value to being useless. So that's that system is is hopeless. And even those companies that aren't thinking about the circular economy, but are using e-commerce, 
don't have a good return system. So a lot of what comes back, if it's fashion that's been uh, tried on once, um, it might not be fit to go out again, so it's just wasted. If it's um, if it doesn't have the packaging, say say something's gone wrong with the product and you don't have the original packaging and you send it back in um, another form of packaging, it can be completely wrecked by the time it comes back. So there's an awful lot to think about in terms of how is this product going to come back? Where is it going to come back from? Where will it have finished um, the end of its use cycle? If we think about packaging, then if something is recyclable, but it's only recyclable in certain circumstances, um, say it has to go back through a local council system and that product is consumed on the beach, in the park, something like that, it's not going to even go into a recycling system. So companies need to think through where's this product going to be used or where might it go wrong and how do we get it back in the right circumstances? And what about legislation in the European Union? We can't send waste across a country border. And that might just be that somebody's classified a product as faulty in order to return it. And so that means that legally it's waste instead of it being something that's coming back for repair. So you really need to, to think through all the scenarios of how you want product to come back and how product might come back, whether you want it or not. And think through, um, you know, what are the scenarios? How do we make sure the product comes back in good condition? Can we do something like include a return label on the product so, com so customers always know how to send it back? Um, where to get the, um, you know, can we send a courier to go and pick it up? Because that might be, it might be better to spend the money on that than have something that was working when it was returned. And by the time it's come through the reverse logistics system, it's now trash. Yeah. So okay. I'm not sure if that, does that answer the question for Ludmilla, do you think? Yeah, I think we'll, we will need another hour with you, Catherine, for, for, for more debate. Uh, people are very excited here, uh, asking lots of questions. I have lots of questions. I think we'll have to organize a, a, a second webinar. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. But I will ask a last question here from Carlos Palbu, and then maybe we can have the, the, the final remarks. Um, his question is about um, business models related to resale, repair, reuse, restore. Um, which one do you think is the most underestimated business model? Uh, he mentioned that he lived in Japan for a couple of years. And there they have all these part of stores. They are specialized in restore. So adding value and reselling. Uh, that can be from clothes, furniture, home appliance. Um, we don't, we used to have this a lot in Brazil, but not anymore. So how do you see what's the barrier and, and what are the opportunities for this type of business models? Mm. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And I think if we go back to our circular economy loops, then we know that reuse and resale are on the inside and, and should have the highest priority. And I also think that the the, um, the question's correct in, in saying that there isn't very much activity around resale um, and reuse. Things might need some refurbishment, but I think a lot of products when, when we finish using them are still fit for purpose and could be resold, but people don't know what to do with them or perhaps with, with phones and with clothing what we're tempted to do because we know we've invested some money in, in it, it feels wrong to just say, I'll oh, finish using this now, I'll, I'll pass it on because we still mentally um, think about the money that we, that we used when we bought that product. But if we had a better way of getting them back into the system so that we could recover money from it, um, then that, that would work more effectively. And um, I've forgotten the name of the company. Oh, Stuffster. Um, in America are doing lots of work with brands and with retailers to help consumers go online with your end of use product. So it might be a, um, a coat or a jacket that you've used for a couple of months and now you've decided 
um, you know, the color's not right or whatever, you can go online and check the value for that product. And if you're happy with the value, then you just send it off. And it's, it's professionally cleaned and goes back out uh, for resale. And those companies that are able to prove the authenticity, um, like uh, examples would be the real real in the, in the United States um, and Vestiaire in France uh, selling fashion items. So they're putting a lot of effort into making sure that what they sell is authentic. It's not, um, if it says, um, you know, Gucci or Nike or, or um, whatever on it, that, that's what it really is. It's not a fake product. Um, and it's refurbished and you know if you're going to buy it as a used product that it's going to be in great condition. You're not going to be disappointed. And I think that's the key. And that's where a lot of value uh, can be regained. Mm. No, fantastic. I think it's it's important to, to highlight what you also said before, the difference between repair and remanufacture. And the fact that a remanufacture means that the company that has manufactured that goods brings back the product repair and place the product into the market with the same quality as the original. Mm. Uh, but because it used less material uh, to put that material, uh, that product back into the market, it costs less. Uh, the Dutch say it's the, the second life. Yeah, the, the first use and the second use. So it's better than saying reuse. So it's a second, mm. second market. Is the first market and the second market. So it's very interesting. I think circle economy uh, for us to present the benefits is very important. The narrative, you know, the communication, the, yes. the understanding around. Uh, we need to establish a new culture, a new culture that values more effectiveness rather than efficiency, experience uh, rather than just ownership, you know, having access. Um, so I, I really would like, uh, thank you very much, as my colleagues say here, outstanding presentation. And, and debate. Uh, this is very much what our study group is about. Yeah, we, we, we launched our study group in 2016. It was the first uh, group of people that gathered to study the economy in Brazil. Uh, we had the opportunity to have knowledge exchange webinars like that back in 2016 with a lot of experts. So we had uh, exchange with about 10 experts from seven different countries on the first year. And, and so we value a lot this knowledge exchange and, and especially the debate because we see now with this interconnected world that we have access to a lot of information uh, you know, this, this webinar will be there saved in our uh, uh, YouTube channel. People can watch later. So we have access for a lot of information. But to transform information into knowledge, it needs a lot of critical thinking, a lot of debates, and a lot of experimentation. Uh, we need to put into practice to see how exactly it works. Uh, so thank you very much for sharing with us all your experience. Uh, the case studies that you presented are uh, amazing. It's, it's very good to have practical results to inspire both industry and, and uh, professional people to, to want to study more, to want to understand in order to have a working force uh, uh, capable of uh, thinking things in a different way. So we, we, a lot of people have already asked for your book. So I hope more people have access to the book. And very shortly at the end of the year, we're gonna have our book also uh, published with the learning of all these years, all this knowledge exchange. We invited uh, 16 international experts from 10 different countries to write articles. We have the preface from Professor Walter Stahel uh, in our book, so um, hopefully I will have the we we'll have the chance to to pub another one in collaboration with you. You know this webinar uh, part of the next book, right? 
Yeah, let, let's let's because I think it's still uh, uh, a last message for me is that even though from many many years we used to say here in Brazil, oh, this is going to take ten years to arrive in Brazil. You know, we can wait. We don't need to change our habits and our process now. What I realized now, especially with circular economy, is happening everywhere at the same time. Even though the countries have different cultures, uh, uh, the, the need for for new business model is eminent in in every country. You know, mm. the consumer is starting to get really concerned about, it. and companies are global companies, so they have to to act and present their products in a different way in any market. Um, so important to have this this discussion, this debate, because we are learning together, right? How to 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 present this to the market. So um, thank you very much. I want to allow a few minutes for us to have a debate in Portuguese, so people they are not really confident to 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 talk in English. We can have a uh, uh, ten more minutes now talking in Portuguese and really building the strength and the potential of our network here in Brazil. Thank you very much, Catherine. I will ask my colleagues here if they want to say a few words or if you want to, to have some final remarks, please feel free to do so. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Beatriz. Yeah. Keep going. Sorry. Uh, pessoal, eu gostaria, antes de tudo, agradecer ao pessoal que mandou, que é o pessoal que mandou pergunta para a gente antes, é, previamente, né, antes de começar o, o webinar, que foi o pessoal da Vanessa Teodoro, o professor Júlio Campos e a Johannes de Vera, e a todos que fizeram as perguntas aqui no Zoom e no YouTube, que foi o, Pat, o Patrick, a Natália, o Carlos Eduardo, a Érica e a Ludmilla. Muito obrigado a vocês todos que participaram e contribuíram aqui com o nosso webinar e com a nossa conversa com a Catherine. Catherine, Danilo was just thanking all the people that participated here and, and asked for questions. We will compile all the questions and maybe put in a in a document and we'll send over to you. So you. you you might want to to consider that and we can send to everybody afterwards as well. So thank you very much, Catherine. Speak to you soon. So everybody gives much. away, Catherine. <laughs> Catherine, thank you very much. Feel free to, to, to make your final. I'll, I'll take a picture of you, you know, for our collection. Smile. <laughs> yes, Natalia, you can you can say something. No, just that I think Catherine, we're gonna talk about just the final remarks, right, Catherine? No, no, I was just going to say thank you for inviting me and I hope um, we've covered um, some new examples for people and uh, I look forward to seeing some great examples from Brazil over the next year or so as we emerge into this new abnormal. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. Thank you very much. So okay, thank you. Catherine. Goodbye. What's up? So we can switch to Portuguese now. <risos> Muito obrigados a todos. É, eu Vamos acredito. Falar do próximo dia. Acredito que foi um debate muito bacana. Eu estou aqui inspirada com os novos cases e as, os argumentos que ela usou. É, vou abrir aí para um debate para quem quiser perguntar, mas antes disso convido o Danilo para já comunicar para a gente qual vai ser o próximo. É, o uhum. tema e a, e a data, Danilo? Sim, pessoal. Então, teremos mais um webinar agora no dia 15 de junho, vai ser uma segunda-feira, e ele vai, vai ser feito num formato diferente. Eu vou continuar sendo o host, mas não será uma pessoa a falar. Eu juntei uma série de especialistas de, de, em economia circular, mas de especialidades das humanidades. Então, nós teremos advogados, sociólogos é, falando sobre o tema e eles vão dar a visão deles sobre a transição para a economia circular. Então, eu, eu vejo isso, a minha ideia por trás dessa, desse webinar, por trás desse bate-papo que eu quero fazer, 
é que desde que eu comecei a estudar e, a, e anotar o tema, ele sempre tem sido discutido por uh, engenheiros e, e mais a galera, mais o pessoal de, de, de gestão e das engenharias. E como o meu background não é de engenharia nem de, nem de gestão, eu queria trazer é, esse tema mais para perto de mim e mais para perto das pessoas que também têm interesse mas que não está no centro das discussões. Então, vamos falar principalmente sobre lei e vamos falar também da PNRS, a Política Nacional de Resíduos Sólidos e da abertura que ela tem para poder facilitar a implementação da economia circular no Brasil. É, teremos um sociólogo também, o Fabiano Sandes, que vai falar sobre a visão da, da sociedade na transição para a economia circular que isso é tido como um dos grandes, uma das grandes barreiras para a transição, que é o fator cultural, seja ele na sociedade ou seja ele dentro das empresas. Então, fiquem atentos, eu vou, eu vou, eu já estou trabalhando nesse nesse webinar e daqui a um mês e dois dias vai ser o webinar de junho e tá todo mundo convidado de novo, vai fazer do mesmo esquema. Eu estou vendo ainda se eu vou conseguir fazer pelo Zoom ou pelo Google Meeting, isso aí a gente vai decidir. E vamos colocar todo o convite no, 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 no Facebook, no LinkedIn, do NEC, e todo mundo está convidado, beleza? A ideia é que a cada webinar a gente traga um tema diferente, um dos multiplicadores vai liderar o debate, sempre com um debate diferente, e esse foi uma proposta do, do Danilo, trazendo essa questão da multidisciplinariedade, né? a importância Exatamente. de ter é, outros especialistas debatendo o tema. A gente vai ter também a Natália trazendo questões de modelo de negócio, de produto como serviço, IoT, Big Data, como Vamos está. Sobre indústria 4.0, materiais tecnológicos, o pessoal do Max. E, e toda a nossa comunidade NEC, né, gente, é sempre é, é muito aberta para receber sugestões de temas e sugestões de palestrantes. Então, se vocês que ainda não fazem parte do NEC, né, têm contatos com grupos que estão discutindo economia circular e acham bacana trazer isso para discussão, preenche o nosso formulário do NEC, né, segue a página no Facebook, que agora é para 2020, a gente está remodelando todo o nosso modelo, toda a nossa comunicação e a gente vai começar a compartilhar essas informações com mais frequência. Então, para quem acompanha o mercado, acompanha o tema ou faz pesquisa nessa área, vai ser um, muito bacana. Agora, esse segundo semestre, vai vir uma enxurrada de conteúdo internacional aí. Então, fiquem à vontade para participar, para dividir e para aprender com a gente também, que é a grande ideia do NEC, é estar aprendendo todo mundo junto. Exatamente, acho que é um bom ponto, é essa troca que a gente realiza, a gente quer criar justamente um ambiente de discussão aberto para todos, então trazerem é, tópicos para discussão, é, podemos fazer um de política pública com a Vanessa, para o setor texto, estou vendo aqui que ela está conectada aí com a gente também, e queria abrir aí para vocês, é, se vocês quiserem fazer algum comentário, o pessoal que está uh, aqui no Zoom, acho que a gente tem mais uns mais uns Olá, eu sou a Ana Rúbia, eu sou a Ana Rúbia, sou uh, do NEC Caatinga, aqui de Petrolina, uhum. e eu queria parabenizar a todos, uh, foi um, realmente um webinar fantástico, e queria uh, responder especificamente para o Palombo, lá de São Paulo, a gente está trabalhando aqui Uh, no, no Nordeste, sou um game, uh, tablet para crianças ainda menores, para crianças do segundo ano, a antiga primeira série, com conteúdo de economia circular em português, inglês e matemática, o conteúdozinho da Provinha Brasil. Então, a gente acha que a gente tem que começar a economia circular de pequenininho, para a próxima geração ser muito mais saudável. O mantra da gente é um bioma catinga economicamente próspero, socialmente justo e ambientalmente rico, diverso. Obrigado, Ana. Muito bom. É... É, mais alguém que queira fazer um comentário? É... 
Estamos abertos a todos aí para mais um bate-papo. E... Olha, eu estou vendo aqui, Bia, um pessoal falando sobre... Ó, já tem aqui a Priscila falando, quer falar sobre políticas públicas. Já tem o pessoal querendo falar sobre gestão de resíduos. Olha, tem uma pessoa que é especialista em gestão de resíduos, que é minha orientadora, que é se ela um dia... Esse é um papo excelente para fazer com a gente. Bastante é, gente. Eu vou falar um negocinho aqui para vocês. É, para... Qual é o nome daquele garoto? Carlos Eduardo, né? Que Sim. perguntou sobre educação. E estou vendo a Ana Rubi ali. É? Então, é, nós temos um bonequinho aí, que é o brasileirinho, né? e que ele está pensando na economia circular, pensamos até na é, a base ser esse, esse curso de economia circular do Senai, certo? Nós estamos construindo uma cartilha, aliás, eu preciso falar com você, viu, dona Ana Rúbia? <risos> Beatriz já falou a respeito, né? Eu acho que, inclusive, tem muita coisa para fazer, já estamos fazendo, e ontem eu tive uma, uma grata satisfação, eu achei um curso de introdução à ecologia para crianças, que foi feito nos idos dos anos 80, 90, e o brasileirinho já começou a entrar no Instagram, no Facebook, entendeu? Então, eu acho que Estamos avançando bem rápido. Tem um grupo, né? Nós estamos com um grupo que a Beatriz é a mentora, né? E que a gente está caminhando. E eu acho que tem algum, algumas pessoas desse grupo que estão tá participando desse webinar, dessa videoconferência, né? Então, eu acho que tem muita coisa para se desenvolver, né? Muito bom, Maria. Obrigada, Maria. É, eu acho que esse aqui é o potencial do nosso grupo. É, a gente vai criando dias é, entre os especialistas de diversas regiões. Então, olha que legal. De Lorena para Petrolina, de São Paulo para o Rio de Janeiro. É, essa é a troca que a gente faz para o debate, para o aprendizado mútuo para realmente tentar materializar a realidade brasileira. É, então, eu queria agradecer a todos. É, passamos dez minutinhos do tempo, mas eu acho que foi incrível. Muito conteúdo, muito debate. Obrigada a todos. Ficamos com o quadro. Como a Natália falou, a gente está é, revitalizando aí o nosso site, o nosso plano de comunicação, a interação com todos, através de um de um mês mais estudado, tem que se unir a nós, pra, pra... é um grupo voluntário. Não tem é, fins lucrativos, o nosso fim é o aprendizado mútuo, então a gente sempre precisa de pessoas que estão com disponibilidade e comprometimento, intenção para botar a mão na massa e fazer não só as coisas circularem, mas o conhecimento circular também. É, Obrigada a todos, um grande abraço. É, Danilo, últimas palavras. Natália, vocês que me ajudaram aí a, na coordenação. Obrigada, Ana Rubia, obrigado, Carlos, obrigado, Cris, obrigado, Luiz, e é, todos os multiplicadores que estão aqui junto com a gente, Patrick, lá da, Ingra lá da Inglaterra. E, e, e todos os outros, me desculpa se eu não mencionei algum, mas bom saber que a gente tem vocês aqui, é, conte conosco e se, mandem suas sugestões e um beijo a todos. Obrigado, pessoal. Até a próxima. Vou encerrar aqui a nossa reunião. Obrigada, pessoal. Boa tarde.